Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Throughout this series, I've made some snipes at what I've called the Tolkien melting pot, a catch-all term for the kit bash of fantasy ideas used by Dungeons and Dragons, taking bits and pieces from Tolkien, Moorcock, and Howard. Because of its use in the most popular role-playing game, there's been an assumption that if you do any game using high fantasy, it's got to follow that suit as well. Looking at the glut of people following Critical Role's coattails, this assumption is still there. This was a mindset I opposed vehemently, especially in the mid-2000s when there was a significant pushback towards the growing interest in anime and RPGs. As I mentioned before, I resent the idea that because it's a certain genre, it must be done a certain way because that's the way it's been done. I've called this mode of thinking designed by gospel. Fortunately, just because the gospel thinks it has to be a certain way doesn't mean the designers have to. In fact, not going with the gospel is a good way to stand out, for better or worse. This brings me to Exalted, a game that styles itself as more mythic than high fantasy, specifically its second edition during the height of its boom period. Does it still hold up? Let's find out. White Wolf has always had a penchant for strong visual design, and that tradition continues here. Exalted looks absolutely gorgeous with its visual style and depth of content. This time the artwork was handled by Udon and Imaginary Friends, with many comics between each chapter, the beginning, and the end. All of this contributes to the game's visual identity, allowing the myriad of images to blend in with the text to create a cohesive idea of creation. If I had one nitpick, it's with the character sheet provided in the back. We'll get to explaining why this is the case later, but this one-page sheet is only adequate for characters when they're just starting out. Other than that, solid work. While the setting material dives into many types of exalts, the meat of character creation only covers Solar Exalted, at least in the core rulebook. We'll be following suit with Albert Galan, a former monk who recently awakened as a Solar Exalted. The first step is Attributes, which are grouped into threes of Physical, Mental, and Social. We assign eight points to the primary group, six to the secondary, and four to the tertiary. In this case, we'll go with Physical, Mental, and Social respectively. With this in mind, Albert's attributes are Strength 4, Dexterity 4, Stamina 3, Charisma 3, Manipulation 1, Appearance 3, Perception 3, Intelligence 3, and Wits 2. The second step is Cast, a broad archetype that determines the skills they're adept at, as well as the special ability exclusive to that cast. For Albert, we'll be going with Zenith. Zeniths can be thought of as the priests of the Solar Exalted, but that doesn't imply a religious aspect, it's just one that's common to them. Third are Abilities, Exalted's equivalent to Skills. You have 28 points to spend on this, with 10 of these going into the cast abilities and 5 favorite abilities outside of the cast. Taking this into account, Albert's abilities are Martial Arts 3, Integrity 3, Performance 1, Presence 3, Resistance 2, Survival 1, Occult 3, Awareness 3, Dodge 3, Linguistics 2, and Socialize 1. Fourth, Advantages. This primarily concerns backgrounds, charms, and virtues. The foremost are your resources and alliances, while charms are the primary means of using Exalt's essence, and virtues are the strength of your personal convictions. For charms, we'll go with the following picks. First, Martial Arts Excellency, Serpentine Evasion, Snake Form, Striking Cobra Technique, Armor Penetrating Fang Strike, Essence Fangs and Snake Technique, Snake Strikes the Heel, Uncoiling Serpent Prana, First Dodge Excellency, and Seven Shadow Evasion. For backgrounds, we'll go with one in Cult, three in Artifact, one in Followers, and two in Resources. For Virtues, we have five points to spend, making our Virtue spread Compassion 2, Conviction 2, Temperance 2, and Valor 3. Since Valor is our highest virtue, we'll pick Foolhardy Contempt as our virtue flaw. Fifth, Bonus Points. These can be spent as a kind of cheat on the normal maximums. You have 15 points to spend, and these can be spent on charms, attributes, abilities, backgrounds, and so on. In our case, we'll spend 2 on martial arts, 7 on essence, 1 in followers, 1 in cult, 2 in resources, and 2 in dodge. Finally, the finishing touches, essentially derived stats. First is essence, which powers charms and sorcery. 
This starts at 2 normally, but since Albert has it at 3, this means that he has a total of 14 personal motes, 5 of which are committed to his artifact, and 42 peripheral motes. The latter is less subtle than the former, and when it's used, it becomes more and more obvious that Albert is a Solar Exalted. Next is Willpower, Exalted's extra effort mechanic, which is the sum of the two highest virtues. In Albert's case, that's 5. Character creation has a fair bit of crunch, but the breaking point is going to be charm use. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the charm cascades for every ability, especially since many have their own set of resolutions. There is a way to make it a little easier, but we'll get to that later. Not helping this matter is the fact that White Wolf sucks at making character sheets, especially here. In my experience, I've used custom sheets like the one used in this review more than I have the official one in the book. In fact, I can't think of anyone who uses the official character sheet from White Wolf. Like most of White Wolf's output, Exalted uses the Storyteller system, with some modifications. The majority of actions involve rolling a number of d10s equal to the action's attribute and ability, plus any modifiers. Any die face that comes up as a 7 or higher is a success, and 10s count as 2 successes. This is compared with the difficulty number, usually 1 to 5. It should be noted that the descriptiveness of the action can add a stunt bonus of 1 to 3 dice, depending on the GM's call. If the roll contains no successes and at least one die rolled a 1, it's considered a botch, and the action fails more spectacularly than it normally would. Willpower, much like in other storyteller games, is the primary form of extra effort, and it can be used in one of two ways. A temporary willpower point can be spent to add success to a roll, or to channel a virtue and roll a number of bonus die equal to that virtue's rating. This may be done a number of times per session based on the virtue's rating. That said, having a virtue rating of 3 or higher requires a roll in that rating to act against that virtue. If you succeed in this roll, you must either act according to that virtue or spend a willpower point. If this is your primary virtue, you gain a point of limit, 10 of which activates a limit break or its equivalent depending on the type of exalt. Limit breaks can be controversial, but given how much the game takes inspiration from Greco-Roman myth, I see where they're going with it. That said, I'd recommend the GM be a little lenient when it comes to enforcing virtues. In other words, don't fall into alignment enforcement traps. Exalted splits combat into normal skirmishes, mass combat, and social combat. Now we'll get to the latter two a bit later in, but there's a few things I need to go over first. For starters, multiple actions. When handling more than one action requiring dice rolls, you take a gradual die penalty equal to the total actions taken, with an additional one after the first. This is known as a flurry. In other words, a three-action flurry takes a three-die penalty on the first action, four on the second, and five on the third. Secondly, turn order. Instead of a static initiative, the storyteller system uses a series of ticks that count down from six to zero. Your previous action determines the amount of time you have before acting again known as speed. This is where White Wolf's combat wheel comes into play. At the start, all participants make a join roll. Whoever gets the highest of this roll is considered the reaction count, and thus starts at tick zero. Everyone else gets a number of ticks equal to the difference between their roll and the reaction count. And at this point, obviously, only the participants at tick zero can act. After they do, they gain a number of ticks equal to the action used, and the remaining participants lose one tick. When it comes to calculating attacks and damages, it works as follows. First, the attack roll, which has a difficulty of 1 using dexterity in either archery, martial arts, melee, or thrown, depending on the weapon or attack style used. The target's defense value, be it dodge or parry, subtracts from the roll. If the final amount of successes is at least 1, the attack hits. The damage of the weapon and any excess successes creates the attack's raw damage and the damage type, bashing, lethal, or aggravated. The damage is compared against the target's hardness, if any, and their soak. If the raw damage is lower than hardness, the attack is negated. Otherwise, the raw damage is reduced by soak. The remaining damage is rolled, and any successes are checked in the target's health levels. This damage system is typical of Storyteller, but this is where its origin as accommodating a game like World of Darkness contradicts with the kind of game Exalted is. Simply put, there's a clash between lethality and dramatic epics at play. This is somewhat mitigated by the multiple chance to minimize damage, but it's a bandage at best. Exalted is a game of big ideas, so it's natural to have some degree of conflict between vast armies. Thus, the mass combat system. 
There are four stats that are of importance here. Magnitude, which determines the size of the unit and acts as the unit's health. Endurance, their ability to act between rests and acts as the unit's fatigue. Might, the general power of the unit. And drill, the discipline of the unit and determining available formations. Combat mostly works the same way as skirmishes, but when a unit loses enough health levels equal to the commander's incapacitation, their health resets and the unit loses a point of magnitude. Attacking or being attacked can drain endurance, though a charisma plus war roll can negate this loss. Mass combat is less about dealing a sufficient amount of wounds and more about breaking a unit's morale, as the morale checks can be an easy way to reduce magnitude. Mass combat appears daunting at first, but it's not quite as divorced from skirmishes as it might appear. I'd say the only issue is going to be managing several units at once, depending on the scale of the mass combat. It's best to see it as a sister system to encounters rather than its own set. However, it's a little disappointing there's not much in the way of example armies to fall back on, at least not in the core book. Social combat is used to represent things as small as high stakes negotiating with a merchant, or as big as talking a lord into doing what you want. Unlike encounters and mass combat, the abilities used are not as universally set. Instead, attributes and abilities are used as approaches for the various attacks, such as interrogation, performance, or intimidation. These are typically approached through honesty with charisma or manipulation for deception. There is no social health, the closest being the ability to build up or wear down a target's intimacies or motivation. If a social attack is successful, the target must do as it is asked, or spend one point of willpower to resist the effects of the attack. Spending two willpower can render the target immune to attempts for that approach. Social combat is a fine setup, but I'm not entirely sure why it needs to operate under the system of ticks used in the other combat systems. I think we could have made the presentation of this stronger would have been better examples of intimacies and how they relate to social combat since the text doesn't make it 100% clear where the line between motivation and intimacies lies. Exalted is a game about epics. It rewards thinking big and thinking larger than life. That said, it does have its share of problems. Its crunch can certainly appear daunting, though I'd partially attribute that to the fact that the storyteller system isn't completely optimized for the style of play Exalted wants to be. It's not too surprising that people have adapted Exalted settings into other systems like Cortex Plus and the One Roll Engine. It should be noted that there was a lot I skimmed over, more so than usual. This is because there's a lot of detail in Exalted setting that would be selling it short if I summarized it in a section in this review. It deserves its own video series more than anything. It's very likely that I'll be returning to this game in the future to cover other Exalted types, as well as the setting of creation and its worlds beyond it. Even with the issues of Intimidating Crunch, Exalted 2nd Edition still remains one of my personal favorite RPGs of all time, and thus I feel quite confident in giving the game a stamp of Recommended. It's got its flaws, but I feel the overall package makes up for that. For those delving into the game, I would recommend getting the core book alongside the Storyteller's Companion for its charm suggestions, and a better spread of example antagonists for the GM. Now some of you may be asking why I focused on 2nd edition instead of the more recent 3rd, since I tend to make it a policy to try and focus on the most recent edition of a game that I cover. Well, that's a story for next time. 